Intellectual and Manual Labor, a Critique of Epistemology by Alfred Sonrethel. Uh, this is chapter 10 to 14. So chapter 10, Societies of Production and Societies of Appropriation. We have already made mention of the factor by which the conditions of production within class societies differ from those of classless ones. The contrast hinges on the different nature of the social synthesis. If a society has the form of its synthesis determined by the labor relationship in the production process, thus deriving its fundamental order directly from the labor process of man's acting upon nature, then the society is or has the possibility of being classless. We have spoken of such societies under Marx's term communal modes communal modes of production. Labor is either done collectively by members of a tribe, or if done individually or in groups, the workers still know what each one does and work in agreement. People create their own society as producers. The structure enables us to call them societies of production. The alternative is a form of society based on appropriation. We understand appropriation as functioning between men within society as the appropriation of products of labor by non-laborers, not as sometimes described as man appropriating his needs from nature. Here we must differentiate between unilateral and reciprocal forms of appropriation. Unilateral appropriation of the surplus products leads to the manifold forms of a class society which Marx called direct lordship and bondage. The appropriation here is carried out by the imposition of trip tributes, forced or voluntary, or by plain robbery. It is carried out as a public activity by the rulers and can be based on subjugation or on God-given rights. But the questions which interest us attach to forms of society based on reciprocal appropriation as private exchange. In other words, to the various forms of commodity production. The common feature of all societies of appropriation is a social synthesis affected by activities which are qualitatively different and separated in time from the labor which produces the objects of appropriation. It is unnecessary to stress that no social formation, whether based on production or on appropriation, can be understood without due consideration of the productive forces in their particular state of development. In part one of this book, we attempted to show that a social synthesis affected through the reciprocal forms of appropriation and commodity exchange leads to the inception of intellectual labor of a kind separated from manual labor. From this one might be tempted to generalize and to conclude whatever the social formation, be it one of appropriation or production, the socially synthetic functions will determine the forms of consciousness of its epoch. If this generalization proves true, our analysis might gain significance for our present concern in the struggle for socialism. Chapter 11, Head and Hand in Labor. First of all, it must be stated that no human labor can take place without a degree of unity of head and hand. Labor is not animal-like and instinctive, but constitutes purposeful activity. The purpose must guide the physical endeavor, no matter what kind, to its intended goal as a consequential pursuit. Marx writes, We presuppose labor in a form in which it is an exclusively human characteristic. A spider conducts operations which resemble those of the weaver, and a bee would put many a human architect to shame by the construction of its honeycomb cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax. At the end of every labor process, a result emerges, which had already been conceived by the worker at the beginning, hence already existed ideally. But for us, the essential question is, in whose head is the intended result of the labor process anticipated? Insofar as the labor process is purely individual, the same worker unites in himself all the functions that later on become separated. When an individual appropriates natural objects for his own li livelihood, he alone supervises his own activity. 
Later on, he is supervised by others. Of course, in one special sense, as work carried out as a one-man job, the individual labor process stands at the beginning of commodity production, but not at the beginning of human history. It must thus be decided whether the intended achievement of a labor process is an idea in the head of a single performer or of several collectively, or whether it might lie in an alien head which deals the workers mere snippets of the process, which signify to them no end goal whatsoever. Dependent on these alternatives are the changes in the relationship between head and hand, the relation between intellectual and manual labor. It is important for us to differentiate between personal and social unity or division of head and hand. Personal unity attaches only to the labor of the one man producer. This does not mean that, conversely, all individual one-man production presupposes such a personal unity. For example, the slaves who produced the pottery of textiles by their individual labor were far from being masters of its purpose or form. Personal division of head and hand applies to all labor whose purpose is prescribed elsewhere. Social unity of head and hand, however, characterizes communist society, whether it be primitive or technologically highly developed. In contrast to this stands the social division between mental and manual labor, present throughout the whole history of exploitation and assuming the most varied forms. Viewed as a whole, the development of society moves historically from primitive communism, where production is totally communal, step by step to the extension of individual one-man production, covering every essential area, and thus to the beginning of commodity production. At this stage, the use of coinage heralds the epoch of the social form of thinking as separate, pu as separate pure intellect. Manual production becomes single production, but at the same time, intellectual labor becomes universalized. This middle stage of the historical development was reached in classical antiquity and produced societies of appropriation in their absolute classical form. That of Roman and Greek slave labor, where the slave does not partake in human society. But from the breaking up of this epoch, a process begins where socialization seizes upon production and even upon manual labor itself thus pushing forward to today's stage of development. Now within the capitalist society of appropriation, the preconditions of a modern society of production have ripened. And as Marx and Engels predicted, mankind is face to face with the ineluctable alternative of a society of production or a society of appropriation. My intention is to follow through the main stages of this whole development in the most compressed form. Chapter 12. The beginnings of surplus production and exploitation. By this title, we understand the transition from the primitive communistic society of production to the first forms of society of appropriation. The beginnings of appropriation within society presuppose a growth in productivity or a development in the productive forces of collective communal labor sufficient to expect regular surpluses of a worthwhile dimension over and above subsistence level. As Marx puts it, it is only when men have worked their way out of their initial animal condition, when therefore their labor has been to some extent socialized, that a situation arises in which the surplus labor of one person becomes a condition of existence for another. The first beginnings, the first beginnings of appropriation develop within the community and bring with them slow but nevertheless incisive changes in the conditions of production based on communal property and consumption. Marx recognizes a particular phenomenon as necessarily mediating these changes, namely the rise of exchange with other communities, an exchange having an erosive feedback effect on the order of things within. A more permanent effect arises when those who benefit from the incipient appropriation become active forces driving on the development in their own interests and organizing themselves into a separate social power. Their influence prompts increasing incursions into the communal property, particularly of the land, with growing conditions of dependency for the producers. Gradually, there crystallize hard and fast class divisions within this society, based on inheritance, patriarchy, 
wars of conquest, and extensive plundering and trade. This brief outline is designed to bring out three fundamental factors. In the first place, the primary producers, tillers of land, cattle rearers, etc., remain for a long time communal. Second, the enrichment of the appropriating class occurs in the forms of unilateral appropriation of the surplus product. Third, the exchange of products maintains, for the most part, the character of external trade between different communities. It is only later that exchange develops into the form of the inner social nexus. Individual production started at its earliest with the making of stone tools and weapons, but continued in the artisan crafts of later Neolithic inventions, such as in secondary production like pottery, spinning and weaving, mainly by women. Then towards the end of the Neolithic age in the metal crafts, which were the work of men, the secondary industries became the main area of trade, just as trade became the promoting force for the growth of the secondary crafts. The production of surplus and the class character of wealth underwent a massive impetus through the development and interaction of these two factors, secondary industries and trade, and so set in motion such an incredible achievement as the cultivation of the great fertile river valleys, which from the Nile to the Yellow River occurred within the same time span between the 5th and 3rd millennia BC. Chapter 13, Head and Hand in the Bronze Age. Not before the development of iron metallurgy did individual small-scale farming become the method and the standard of primary production. In between the Neolithic and the Iron Ages lie thousands of years, the millennia of the Bronze Age. This epoch had its own characteristic social formation, that of the ancient oriental cultures, which from the cultivation of the fertile river valleys appears as large scale civilizations compared with the preceding Neolithic communities. For our particular sketch, ancient Egypt will serve as a model, for it is here that the first preliminary forms of the division of intellectual from manual labor appear at their clearest. It is generally recognized that later Greek philosophy and science were heavily indebted to this epoch. The ancient oriental social formation had the character of a two-story structure. The base comprised agriculture and animal husbandry on the fertile land and its surroundings, an economy which we can sum up under the name of alluvial primary production. This was still carried out by the methods of collective communal production, relying on stone tools and not on metal implements because bronze was far too precious to be put in the hands of the cultivators. In other words, the communal character of the form of production was not dissolved. The fertility of the, the alluvial soils was preserved and increased by the skillful and method methodically planned irrigation systems, more or less common to all these civilizations, thus drawing from primary production a surplus which was vast measures or which was vast measured by earlier standards. The occupation and clearance of the river valleys was not done by the producers on their own initiative, but under the whip and direction of the rulers, either of the same or another ethnic origin. From the very beginning, their purpose was to appropriate the increased surplus product. This extraordinary achievement in itself presupposes a decisive division between the dominating and organizing rulers and the physical exertions of the collective primary producers. The delivery of the surplus product by the producers, or alternatively its collection by the rulers and their functionaries, necessitated hardly any additional coercion. It was a result by and large of the reverential obedience of the producers to their rulers. The pharaoh was the supreme owner of the cultivated land, and through his supposed sacred relationship with the powers of nature, guaranteed the producers lasting possession of the soil and the very possibility for their pre for their preservation. The appropriation was public and official activity centered in the pharaoh, whose whole state was organized as a machine for the collection, storage, and disposal of the surplus. This does not exclude the existence of exchange and trade, but it was carried on as external state trade with foreign communities. Based on the appropriation of the vastly increased surplus, a culture now developed which formed the second story of the social formation. 
This employed the crafts of Neolithic origin to th serve the exclusive and qualitatively highly refined needs of the rulers. The metallurgy of bronze and of the precious metals takes first place in these crafts, as in all probability the foundation and achievement of the whole culture would have been impossible using only stone tools. For the furtherance of these secondary crafts, including textiles, woodwork, rope making, stone cutting, jewelry, cosmetics, sculpture, and so on, there unfolds a far-flung trade where the primary products conserved and stored in chambers and greeneries were exchanged for the raw and auxiliary materials necessary for the luxury production. It was a trade carried out with other states and communities by order and in the name of the Egyptian state and in addition benefited their immense building projects and cult activities, state organized mines, expeditions and war campaigns. The exchange trade, however, did not permeate the internal order of these Bronze Age societies. This whole upper story of the civilization rested in direct lordship and bondage on the unilateral appropriation of the primary surplus product. And it was to, and it was to promote this appropriation and its actual performance that script and the art of writing numeration and arithmetic, in other words, symbolic forms and separate intellectual labor came to be conceived and developed. Thus, in our opinion, intellectual in separation from manual labor arises as a means of the appropriation of products of labor by non-laborers, not originally as an aid to production. It served the calculation of tributes, the accounting of credits and repayments in the relation between the temple authorities or officials of the pharaoh and their debtors, the storing and listing of appropriated products, the recording of the volume of incoming or outgoing supplies, and other similar operations. A good illustration is provided by the reports in surmises, surmises of Herodot Herodotus about the origins of geometry in ancient Egypt. Rope was its principal tool and geometry was practiced as a professional skill by people whom the Greeks, translating the Egyptian name literally, called Harpedon Harpedonuts, stretchers of the rope. The teaching and exercise manual of Hamis, or Amis, found in the rind papyrus, together with numerous Egyptian reliefs, show clearly that these stretchers of the rope were assigned, usually in pairs, to the high officials of the pharaoh for the building of temples and pyramids, the laying down and paving of dams, the construction of granaries and measurement of their volume, and most important, to parcel out the soil afresh when it re-emerged after the dispersal of the yearly floods of the Nile. This could evoke the impression that geometry had been invented for the sake of the cultivators, that is, in the relation of man to nature, rather than out of the social production relations and the economy, as Marx would lead one to expect. In actual fact, however, many of the Greek historiographers were inaccurate and incomplete in their presentation. For in the text of Herodotus, he says specifically that this partition of the soil was done for the purpose of reassessing the peasants' tributes for the coming year. Hence, geometry did not appear to the cultivators in their own garb, but in the attire of the pharaoh's tax officials accompanied by their field measurers. If the rope was handled with the necessary dexterity and with the know-how of long experience, one can reasonably suppose that there were few problems of geometry that this technique could not successfully overcome. Among its achievements were the tri tripartition of angles, the magnification and diminution of volumes, including the doubling of cubes, and finally even the calculation of the constant pi, which Amis put at uh, 3.164. That this exercise of geometry could only aspire to approximations, even if at times it achieved amazingly accurate ones, is self-evident, but a claim to mathematical accuracy, had this concept existed, would perhaps have seemed mere pedantry to these geom geom geometricians. Rope stretching was a technique of measuring, nothing more, 
but it involved great skill and yielded a practical use value as high, if not higher, than that of the geometry of the Greeks. According to all appearances, it found acceptance in ancient India too, the earliest textbook of Indian geometry bearing the very title, The Art of the Rope. There also was a special cultivation of the art of counting by means of the abacus. And thus there unfolded in that country through two or more thousand years an art and knowledge of geometry and of numbers which astounded Europe when the Arabians began to make themselves the Islamic propagators of both traditions in the 8th and 9th centuries AD. Joseph Needham has shown that in China there was a similar mathematical knowledge as elsewhere in the Far East. The mystery of the Egyptian calendar and of the astonishingly accurate calculation of the year and of the Nile floods have been robbed of much of their aura of modern research. According to the studies of Siegfried Schott and Richard A. Parker, the alleged sun calendar of Egypt was in reality merely a moon calendar adapted by purely empirical interpolation to what was observed of the orbit of Sirius. The fabulous capabilities of the Egyptians in astronomy are thus reduced to proportions more in keeping with the rest of their proven intellectual practice. The mystification inherent in this astronomy was, however, no error, but was the wily intention of the priests. The benefit to class rule of the mere appearance of the division of head and hand far preceded its real development. One knows of the artificial magic created by the priests to play on the credulity of the masses. Their wizardry went to the extent of bringing their figures of gods and goddesses alive by the action of steam from boiling vessels, which was led through long underground pipes to the altar, so that the gods appeared to open their eyelids and their mouths, and to let off steam in their anger. Thus the make-believe of division of head and hand prevailed in the service of class rule, and long preceded the reality. The textbook of Amis preserved on the rind papyrus in the British Museum, consists of a collection of simple tasks for practical purposes. For instance, of the way to calculate the number of bricks required for the covering of an irrigation dam, of a given height and length and slope. And for each of these tasks, the pupil is given instructions on how to proceed. Even the concept of a theorem lies on a level of abstraction too high for this kind of mathematics, whose very characteristic is the lack of the logic, logical foundation and systematic coherence by which it later assumes its intrinsic division from manual labor. It is true that intellectual and manual labor was already divided into activities of different people, and more important, of separate castes and classes conscious of the distance between each other. But mental labor did not yet possess the intellectual independence which severs it inherently from manual labor, without the need of caste divisions or mystifications. Our particular uh, sorry, our particular interest now centers on the reasons why, at the ancient oriental stage of social formation, the division of intellectual from manual labor lacked an inherent foundation. The base of this formation differed from that of commodity production by the unilateral appropriation operated by the rule of direct lordship and bondage. Its economic context can be likened to that of a huge state household, as Marx puts it, planned and calculated to its finest detail. But however different this practice of unilateral appropriation may have been from the relation of commodity exchange, it contained certain important features in common with the abstract function of the exchange relations. The action of appropriation, just like that of exchange, was most strictly separated in time and place from any use of the appropriated objects. The products were stored and quantified without any change to the state in which they were delivered by the producer and accepted by the appropriator. Moreover, the unchanged substance of the objects of appropriation were not classified under the same terms as were the objects of use or labor. But even without a detailed form analysis of one-sided appropriation, which is not the same in ancient oriental as in medieval feudalism, the essential differences from commodity exchange are obvious. 
He who performed the action of appropriation, official of the pharaoh, priest, scribe, did not act on his own initiative or for his own benefit. He collected the objects but did not deliver them. The man who did deliver them was not his personal debtor. The appropriator was only the functionary of a superior total power, one single link of an entire complex extensive hierarchy in the service of this power. He saw not the whole appropriation, but only one particular part as a particular place and of a particular kind. But even within a specific product, it was not the whole of the kind, not all the barley, not all the corn, which was the object of appropriation, but only the surplus part of it. The other part of the same product remained in the possession of the producers and played quite a different role in the total order of existence. In short, nowhere in this order is a generality reached which is applicable to all its objects or subjects. The objects of appropriation certainly possess an identity as value. Of this, their accounting, the economy of the system, offers direct proof. But this economy has no generality in substance nor in function. However, it is important to understand that precisely those factors which prevent a generalization of value in a form determination make it possible for the total order to be controlled, comprehended, and governed. The thought of the system functionaries lacked rationality in theory to the same degree as the system possessed rationality in practice. This is only the converse of the observation already made that the autonomous intellect is an effect of the exchange mechanism through which man loses control over the social process. Ancient oriental economy was a planned economy. Its irrationalities were not of a kind to make its order uncontrollable. Thus, the results of our survey are twofold. First, the intellectual development which took shape in the Bronze Age occurred in that sphere of social formation based on appropriation separated from production. Second, this intellectual development had not yet achieved any intrinsic division from manual labor because appropriation controlled only a part of the social product and therefore did not constitute the general form of the social synthesis. The division between intellectual and manual labor can only occur when appropriation assumes the reciprocal form of private exchange, when the object of appropriation takes on commodity form, or alternatively, when individual small-scale production spreads to include primary as well as secondary production. This did occur in the epoch of iron metallurgy, when cheap metal tools became available to the primary producers, making them independent of the cumbersome and extensive collective irrigation economy of the alluvial river valleys. Incidentally, their individual labor became more productive than the communal economy of any previous epoch. Chapter 14, The Classical Society of Appropriation. The new iron metallurgy, which emerged onwards from around 1000 BC through or brought about the civilizations of the Phoenicians and, and then of the Greeks, the Etruscans and the Romans. These civilizations required far less space for food production than their prede predecessors. They could populate hilly country, coastal strips and islands and gain advantages from their from their mobility. In order to produce a surplus of their primary production with iron implements, they were no longer dependent upon the cultivation of alluvial river soils. The legends of their heroic early phase prove that they waged raids of destruction, plunder, and abduction in the fabulously wealthy territories of the ancient Oriental Bronze Age civilization. In the process, they acquired the superior craftsmanship and techniques of these older civilizations. They soon caught up and even overtook their predecessors in secondary production and particularly in the making of weapons and building of ships. The individualization of production that now emerged is reflected in the fact that these adventurers indulged their deeds of robbery and pillage on their own account and at their own risk. They were no longer in the service of theocratic rulers or backed by the power of a whole state. They acted as heroes, independent individuals with whom their people and state could identify, devoting themselves in this way to their particular function, the appropriation of existing alien wealth. 
Their mythological frame of reference is still related to that of the Bronze Age civilizations, except that the gods are transformed from what were, in effect, legitimations of the appropriators in the image of a higher power into deities guarding the destinies of the heroes themselves. Here one sees the nucleus of private wealth and of commodity exchange before this exchange leads to the emergence of money. The social revolution brought about by the development of the iron technique is summed up by the George Thompson in the following words. By increasing productivity and so rendering possible new divisions of labor, the use of iron carried still further the process of transforming collective production and appropriation into individual production and appropriation. Hence it marked a new stage in the growth of commodity production. The village commune resting in common ownership and surrendering its surplus in the form of tribute was succeeded by a community of individual proprietors, each producing independently for the open market. Such was the Greek polis, based on the use of iron. Engels follows Lewis Morgan in seeing developed commodity production as synonymous with the first stage of civilization, which he describes as follows. The first stage of commodity production with which civilization begins is distinguished economically by the introduction of one, metal money and with it money capital, interest in usury, two, merchants, as the class of intermediaries between the producers, three, private ownership of land in the mortgage system, four, slave labor as the dominant form of production. I would also add that the first stage of civilization is not only distinguished economically, but that the division of intellectual and manual labor becomes a factor of prime importance. The chief difference between ancient and capitalist commodity production was that the producers remained owners of their means of production. When in fact they lost their ownership, they fell into slavery and became the means of production themselves in person, possessed by their slave owner. The wealth acquired by slave owners and by the landed aristocracy was either by unilateral appropriation by means of tributes, rents, war booty and loots, or by such methods in addition to commerce. Thus occurred a more or less violent redistribution of possessions and property, with a disruptive impact upon the traditional communal and tribal forms of society. The formation of wealth, all of it in terms of substantial riches of jewelry, precious objects, palaces and so on, took place through, through external relations between barbarian or other Greek communities by means of trading, warfare, or colonization. Only when the commercial element grew so dominant that it resulted in the first invention of coinage on the Ionian side of the Aegean, or Aegean, Aegean around 680 BC did the disruptive effects transfer themselves to the internal order of the home community. Engels' description of this process is so powerful and so instructive that it is worth noting at some length. Towards the end of the upper stage of barbarism, through the sale and purchase of land and the progressive division of labor between agriculture and handicraft, trade and shipping, the smooth functioning of the organs of the Gentile constitution was thus thrown so much out of great or out of gear that even the heroic age remedies had to be found. There followed the division of the entire people, regardless of gens, fratry, or tribe, into three classes. Nobles, farmers, and artisans. The power of the nobility continuously increased until about the year 600 BC, it became insupportable and the principal means for suppressing the common liberty were money and usury. The nobility had their chief seat in and around Athens, whose maritime trade with occasional piracy still thrown in enriched them and concentrated in their hands the wealth existing in the form of money. From here, the growing money economy penetrated like corrosive acid into the old traditional life of the rural communities founded on natural economy. The Gentile constitution is absolutely irreconcilable with money economy. The ruin, the ruin of the Attic small farmers coincided with the loosening of the old Gentile bonds, which embraced and protected them. The debtor's bond and the lien on property, for already the Athenians had invented the mortgage also, respected neither gents nor fratry, 
while the old Gentile constitution for its part knew neither money nor debts in money. Hence the money rule of the aristocracy now in full flood of expansion also created a new customary law to secure the creditor against the debtor and to consecrate the exploitation of the small peasant by the possessor of money. All the fields of Attica were thick with mortgage columns. The fields not so marked had for the, for the most part already been sold on account of unpaid mortgages or interest and had passed into the ownership of the noble Yushwar. And that was not all. If the sale of the land did not cover the debt, the debtor had to sell his children into slavery abroad. The rise of private property led to exchange between individuals, to the transformation of products into commodities, and here lies the seeds of the whole subsequent upheaval. But the Athenians were soon to learn how rapidly the product asserts its mastery over the producer when once exchange between individuals has begun and products have been transformed into commodities. With the coming of commodity production, individuals began to cultivate the soil on their own account, which soon led to individual ownership of land. Money followed, the general commodity with which all others were exchangeable. But when men invented money, they did not think that they were again creating a new social power. The one general power before which the whole of society must bow, and it was this new power suddenly sprung to life without knowledge or will of its creators, which now, in all the brutality of its youth, gave the Athenians the first taste of its might. There is no doubt that this complete social revolution must have been associated with its own appropriate form of thought. We have explained how the exchange abstraction can become the role of the social nexus. George Thompson has not only confirmed and supported the study of angles, but has carried the inquiry to greater depths and new results. From Ionia, the medium spread across the Aegean to Aegina, Euboea, Corinth, Athens, and a little later to the Greek colonies in Italy and Sicily. Thus, Greek society was the first to be based on a monetary economy. The significance of this development has seldom been appreciated. George Thompson, like myself, links the rise of commodity production in Greece with the rise of Greek philosophy. I make a differentiation between primitive exchange on the one hand and, and private commodity exchange on the other. The former was contemporary with the various forms of communal modes of production and evolved chiefly in the external relations between different tribal communities. Its beginnings preceded the development of the exploitation of man by man and in fact helped to promote the progress of the productive forces preconditional to the rise of such exploitation. In its initial stages, as we have described by the example of ancient Egypt, exploitation took the shape of systems of direct lordship and bondage. When the productive forces developed further by the transition from bronze to iron age, communal food production was superseded by individual, individual production combined with an exchange of a new kind, the private exchange of commodities. Commodities then answer the Marxian definition as products of the labor of private individuals, who work independently of each other. This kind of exchange, commodity exchange properly speaking, is the one which is characteristic of Greek antiquity. It leads to a monetary economy and to a system of social synthesis centered on private appropriation. Whereas in the system of direct lordship and bondage, as in Egypt, appropriation is public and relates to production. Here, appropriation is private in such a way that one act of appropriation relates to a reciprocal counteract, counteract, both linked under a postulate of equality. This constitutes a network of social synthesis entirely in terms of property. Production is done by chattel slaves who are owned by their masters as their personal property and who themselves do not take part in that network, network of property, having no access to money. Here we have the social system of reification governed by the anonymous rule of the exchange abstraction. The contrast between the proto-intellectual labor of the Bronze Age and the real intellect is vividly stated by Benjamin Farrington. With the Greeks, the new and most important element did enter science. This is the element of speculative philosophy, which constitutes the specific quality, the real originality of Greek science. 
The organized knowledge of Egypt and Babylon had been a tradition handed down from generation to generation by priestly colleges. But the scientific movement, which began in the 6th century amongst, among the Greeks, was entirely a lay movement. It was the creation and the property, not of priests who claimed to represent the gods, but of men whose only claim to be listened to lay in their appeal to the common reason in mankind. The Greek thinker who advanced an opinion stood behind the opinion himself. He claimed objective validity for his statements, but they were his own personal contribution to knowledge, and he was prepared to defend them as such. Consequently, with the Greeks, individual scientists begin to emerge, and the specific quality of scientific thinking begins to be recognized. To put the matter in another way, the worldview of the Egyptians and Babylonian, Babylonians was conditioned by the teaching of sacred books. It thus constituted an orthodoxy, the maintenance of which was in the charge of colleges of priests. The Greeks had no sacred books. Thales, born about 630 BC, who founded the early Ionian school, is the first man known to history to have offered a general explanation of nature without invoking the aid of any power outside nature. Too little is known of the historical details of the beginnings of the conceptual mode of thinking for us to be certain of the social class of its main protagonists. Significant, however, is its place of origin. Miletos, on the Ionian coast of the Aegean Sea, or Aegean, Aegean, Aegean Sea, was the foremost center of the commercial activity and colonial expansion of the Greeks and the Eastern Mediterranean. Mediterranean down to Nauplia in Egypt. North to the Black Sea and as far west as Massalia, the present Marseille. Or Marseille. Thales himself was, according to Herodotus, partly of Phoenician descent and belonged to an ancient family of priest kings, as also did his contemporary Anaxim, Anaxim oh, for fuck's sakes, Anaximander perhaps the greatest of the Ionian philosophers. Thales, in addition to his interests in science, technology, philosophy, and geometry, was also reputed to have organized a corner in oil and pursued other commercial activities. By the end of the 8th century, as George Thompson records, the Greeks had broken the Phoenician monopoly of the Aegean, carrying trade, and were challenging them in the Levant. From the same century, chattel slavery developed, and the Milesian merchants were selling slaves from the northern colonies to Egypt and Syria in the 7th century. Early in the 8th century, the traditional rule of the landed aristocracy had been overthrown, following which Miletos itself was shaken by political upheavals and alternating regimes of tyranny and democracy. From the end of the 7th century, the city-state suffered two generations of civil war. George Thompson sums up ancient Greek history in these words. The truth is that just because they were based on small scale production, the Greek city states having grown up in conformity with the new developments in the productive forces, especially iron making and the coinage, were able under the democracy to insinuate slave labor sur surreptitiously into all branches of production and so create the illusion that it was something ordained by nature. It was then that slavery seized on production in earnest. This was the culmination point in the evolution of ancient society, to be followed by a long decline in which the limitations inherent in the slave economy asserted themselves on an ever-increasing scale, obstructing the further development of the productive forces and diverting the energies of society from the exploitation of nature to the exploitation of man.